Well, welcome everyone to this uh, breakout session of the Denver Democracy Summit. Uh, my name is Timothy Sisk. I'm a professor of international and comparative politics at the Joseph Corbell School. And I'm very pleased to be co-hosting this breakout session uh, together with my colleague, Professor Rachel Epstein, who is a professor of international political economy at the Corbell School and uh, associate dean uh, for research. Um, I will be introducing our panelists in just a, a moment, but I wanted to uh, start out with a brief opening word about the topic of our breakout session, democracy under threat perspectives from the front lines. Uh, for those who were able to attend the earlier uh, events this morning and the Denver Democracy Summit, we heard plenty about democracy under threat around the world. And uh, a lot of uh, very interesting discussion about the nature of uh, so-called autocratization, a trend line that started maybe uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, the one uh, sort of opening uh, remarks I'd like to say is really about the, um, the notion of uh, that autocracy is growing around the world. I think what was missed by some of the earlier panelists um, today was the extent to which uh, these trends toward greater autocracy around the world are also being met with uh, uh, resistance uh, to these trends from uh, Myanmar to Belarus uh, to here in the United States. We've seen that efforts to, uh, to further uh, entrench uh, autocracy has been uh, resisted. And so this uh, breakout session on perspectives from the front lines really gives us an insight a little bit into some of these uh, aspects of resistance, as well as some of the concerns with growing autocracy. And that autocracy we know, you know, evolves both within democracies where there have been constraints on rights and freedoms and uh, um, crises, uh, as we've seen here in the United States. Um, also, we've seen within autocracies around the world worsening conditions, and I think the case of Myanmar I mentioned a moment ago is, is yet another one. Uh, but there's a third element of this too. I think it's important that we all keep in mind uh, that uh, like in Myanmar, also to a certain extent in Ethiopia, we've seen transitions to democracy, which have been uh, aborted or arrested, and that this is also part of the overall autocratization issue, uh, as well as the questions of resistance. So we've got a great set of panelists here. I won't take any more of uh, your time uh, with my own thoughts on it, but I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, we're very, very pleased to have them as we're pleased to have you here as participants in this breakout session. We've asked our panelists to give about seven to 10 minutes of uh, opening remarks and then we'll open it up. And my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Epstein will be moderating that Q&A. Well, our first speaker, we're very, very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Lablo, uh, Laszlo Brust uh, from the uh, center, uh, excuse me, uh, the Central European University. He is co-director of the Democracy Institute there and a professor of sociology. Uh, prior to uh, that, he was a professor at the European University Institute in Florence, where I have a feeling he got to uh, meet our colleague, Professor uh, Epstein, who was also there uh, at that time. His work uh, is really uh, quite interesting. I would encourage you to, to take a look at some of his publications available online. He looks at the intersection of markets and regions in Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and comes to us uh, as a um, you know, perspective from the front lines. Uh, we also want to keep in mind his very critical role during the transition uh, there in Hungary in 1989, uh, where we know from uh, democratization elsewhere that trade unions play such a critical role. So he brings both a, a very personal experience uh, to these issues, as well as wide ranging scholarly expertise. Uh, then our second speaker, I couldn't be happier to introduce, uh, well, I'll just put it out there, a former student of mine, uh, Brett Lacey, uh, who uh, took an MA here at the Corbell School in 2005. And uh, Brett um, uh, was uh, uh, one of our top students working in the area of democracy, wrote a fantastic uh, MA thesis on 
uh, voting by internally displaced persons uh, and that voting uh, by IDPs is still so relevant in our world today. We see in, uh, uh, cases like Ethiopia, which I mentioned, you know, uh, sliding into elections later this year, uh, yet is a country with a very high proportion of uh, internally displaced persons among its populations. After the Corbell School, uh, Brett went on to a very um, prestigious fellowship at uh, IFAS at the uh, uh, International Foundation for Election Systems, where she won the Hibble Fellowship and then became a senior program officer at the National Democratic Institute uh, after a short stint uh, with uh, International IDEA there in uh, Stockholm. Uh, after uh, serving as a senior program officer there at NDI, uh, she has, for the last uh, decade or more, uh, worked at the Carter Center uh, and is now associate director of the Carter Center and has very frontline experience in a key area, which is sort of international assistance uh, to democratization and democracy processes. She's worked in Timor-Leste and Nicaragua, Guyana, Zambia, uh, working with civil society, political parties, and uh, working as the Carter Center does on electoral processes and electoral monitoring missions. Uh, so we've got a great uh, a set of um, uh, uh, panelists and discussants for our breakout session. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Laszlo, for your uh, for some introductory remarks to kick, kick us off on this breakout. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, uh, first, uh, I think Rachel uh, wanted to ask uh, a question. Laszlo, what would be great if you have um, some, so given your long experience in uh, democratizing and then de-democratizing uh, country, Hungary, which came up several times in the sessions earlier today. I wonder, Lazo, if you would just give us an overview of, as the title of the panel suggests, creeping uh, autocratization in Hungary and what it is like, both within the Hungarian setting and also in the European setting, to uh, experience it firsthand. What has been the trajectory? How has, uh, how has Fidesz, Orban, how have they aggrandized power at the expense of individual rights in the settings with which you're most familiar? We can start there. Thank you very much. Uh, That's a great question because behind this question also is this idea uh, that, uh, and, and actually the, 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 the whole panel uh, is the idea that uh, uh, autocratization uh, uh, is a longer process uh, that can unfold in different ways. As I am a comparativist for me, Hungary and the Central European cases are one type of uh, genre where uh, uh, previously seemingly uh, stable democracies uh, uh, experience uh, uh, processes of, of de-democratization like uh, Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, uh, and to lesser extent some of the other uh, Central and Eastern European countries. That's very different from uh, you, uh, uh, it was mentioned before, like Belarus and others who were stable uh, authoritarian regimes where uh, democratization attempts failed. Uh, so I'm talking about this Hungarian experience. And, and uh, what uh, uh, I think I can make two points about that uh, in this brief introduction. The one is that uh, uh, autocratization starts way before uh, autocrats appear on the scene. Uh, and uh, it's... Uh, 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 in these cases, uh, democracies were hollowed out, uh, uh, weakened, uh, emptied uh, uh, by Democrats. Uh, and uh, they played uh, a very important role uh, in uh, depoliticizing major issues uh, uh, of uh, economic and social transformation, uh, marginalizing uh, 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 political forces, depoliticizing, uh, oh, sorry, uh, neutralizing uh, uh, values of participation. Uh, so the second point comes in that uh, that uh, uh, also politicians and uh, like Orban with authoritarian tendencies uh, enter in this void, uh, enter in a situation in which they offer. Uh, opportunities for political participation. They are the ones uh, uh, who give new meaning uh, to participation uh, 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 with uh, uh, very strong populist ideas in which uh, 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 they basically set in motion what I would call uh, 
autocratization from below uh, in the sense that what they do is they uh, uh, polarize uh, the political field, uh, set the other stage, the previous uh, or all the other political parties that play the role in creating this void as uh, enemies of the nation who prevent uh, meaningful uh, 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 representation of national uh, interests. Uh, several things play the role in that, but uh, so I can go just in a big brush uh, ways, just highlighting uh, a few uh, points. One is uh, uh, already in the 1990s, when economic transformation starts in the, the uh, Eastern and Central European countries, there is a, a pervasive dominance of uh, neoliberal ideas that see democracy as not necessarily as a part of the problem, but it's a problematic uh, uh, a part uh, of social and economic transformation. So uh, I have to be brief, but uh, uh, there is this general idea uh, that comes uh, uh, from these circles, and that's very important, that dominates the left and the liberal, the center left and the center right uh, in most of these countries. This idea is that uh, uh, political participation and uh, actually, uh, all the opportunities provided by democracy might hinder uh, uh, successful uh, transformation. And it's very important uh, uh, to, if not completely neutralize, but do uh, 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 as much as possible to pursue uh, 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 policies without relying on on uh, the opportunities provided by democracy. Uh, uh, the word, uh, uh, one of the dominant words in politics in, in the 90s uh, uh, in Central Eastern Europe is the shock therapy, which is basically an expression coming from medicine. Uh, I think of society as a sick uh, uh, patient that needs a you know, sort of anesthetization, uh, neutralization before it can experience uh, uh, the reforms that will lead to the radiant future. So. Uh, uh, that was very important. And then comes uh, uh, another process that is uh, much more positive, uh, but uh, this European integration. Uh, European integration uh, is, uh, I don't think that there are uh, anyone in Latin America or in any other uh, uh, part of the world would die for joining uh, a free market zone. That's uh, different in Europe. In Central and Eastern Europe, uh, 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 governments were punished. Uh, if they didn't uh, meet uh, all the requirements uh, in time uh, uh, made by uh, the European Union, just in order to join uh, the single European market uh, and market integration. Now, it's very important that whereas the whole process was very strongly supported, it had a robust political support from below. So it's not, uh, it was not imposed. It was not like Sovietization. Uh, uh, it was really uh, enjoying strong support. It was done in the most technocratic way you can imagine. Uh, uh, that is, uh, that introduced uh, around 80,000 pages of, of market regulations in more than 30 different uh, policy areas uh, without ever politicizing in this process uh, the potential social and economic consequences uh, uh, of it. So uh, just to give you an example, the NAFTA agreement, the renegotiation of NAFTA agreement in the US, uh, you might uh, recall that, uh, for example, in the issue of dairy regulation, there was a more than one year delay in ending the negotiations because of the potential consequences of uh, 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 that uh, on uh, uh, dairy producers in Canada and in uh, the Mexico. And uh, uh, now uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, no one even knew about what is the content uh, of that. Very few people uh, 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 cared about that. And that was uh, uh, going hand in hand with this pervasive idea that Europeanization is modernization. We have been modernized these societies. And it, it, so it's not a problem that uh, uh, major issues of development, social economic development, are not discussed in public. Uh, and not, uh, uh, there is no participation in that. And uh, uh, I can go on with that. But uh, 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 the left liberal governments in Hungary and partly also in Poland uh, played a very important role in uh, in uh, depoliticizing the issues, keeping them uh, as uh, non-relevant political issues. 
and uh, uh, played a very important role also uh, uh, independently of this Europeanization in uh, weakening self governments, local self governments, uh, uh, and uh, trade unions and NGOs. This is the void in which I have, I need one minute. Can I get? One minute, yeah, please. One minute, sorry, yeah. So this is the void in which Orban enters uh, 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 by mobilizing, uh, by uh, saying that it's organizing mass movements. Uh, 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 nearly in every village, there was a circle, a uh, uh, civic circle. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people participated and it, uh, it uh, not just mobilized, but it gave a meaning to this participation. That is, they represent the interest of the nation, the uh, nation first, uh, uh, against uh, those who uh, uh, sell out the country. Uh, and it was not uh, uh, from this process, we just get and here I finish, uh, to 2010, when he comes to power and organizes the single largest uh, demonstration in the history of Hungary with 500,000 people marching on the streets of Budapest with this banner, we won't be colony. That's how mm -hmm. Europeanization uh, uh, ends. Uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, my point only was that uh, uh, that was well prepared. Yes. Okay. So I am going to turn it over to Brett in one second, but I just want to mention one thing and I'm going to invite people to uh, enter questions also into the um, Q&A section. But Laza, one thing that you said is very interesting, which is somewhat different from what we heard today. There is a sense, at least in the United States and maybe elsewhere, that partisanship is running too high and too many issues are made political. And what you're saying by contrast with respect to creeping autocratization is that it's the opposite that's a problem, right? So there has to be some kind of, I'll let you answer that, don't answer it yet, but it's, yeah, there has to be some kind of middle ground where we pay attention to the politics and the distributional struggles, uh, right? So they don't get swept under the carpet as you just described in the service of democratic governance and representation. But there's also a sense, at least in my own country, mm -hmm. that the political struggles have become too intense and senseless in a way. Okay, but we'll return to that in a minute and hopefully some of that discussion sparks some questions from our audience. Brett Lacey, please give us an overview of um, your work and what you've seen from the Carter Center. Sure, happy to. Um, and thank you so much for, for having me. It's nice to be back even virtually um, at my alma mater. So thanks so much for the invitation. Um, and I guess I just wanna say that I started my career's focus on democracy back in the 1990s and spent some time in South Africa during Nelson Mandela's presidency right at the end of apartheid. And at the time, like on the Freedom House Index, the number of countries that were marked as free and partly free was on the rise. And it seemed like there was so much hope and that democracy was you know, something that was taking hold and was gonna stick. And I, I reflect on that a lot now, um, you know, especially the last couple of years. Um, because I, I'm not sure that then I could have predicted um, this, these kinds of challenges and, and backsliding um, that we're experiencing um, now. But I, I, I do hope, um, I, I think there's still potential to get back there um, to that time when, when democracy is on the rise. So um, I continue to, to reflect on that. Um, and I also wanna share that you know, there have been some real advances in recent years, even though there has been this backsliding, there have been some important gains in West Africa and um, Sudan, the peaceful civilian protest um, that you know, brought an end to President Bashir's 30 year reign. Um, there are some democratic institutions have held strong in some countries, um, even amid um, this backsliding. Um, Malawi um, is an important case for me where the judicial system nullified controversial election results um, in 2019 and ordered a new election that was held in 2020 that led to a peaceful transition of power. And that was you know, an, an instance for me of a democracy that was under threat, but had institutions that you know, had enough strength to handle that crisis and get the country to a democratic outcome. Um, but democracy has definitely taken some hits. Um, there was a coup in Mali, um, now the coup in, in Myanmar um, that Dr. Sis mentioned, um, an attempt to undermine the will of the people here in the United States, questions around term limits um, and the constitutionality of candidacies of incumbent presidents is you know, still a threat. Um, and we've seen that in Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea. Um, recently, and democracy everywhere is struggling to be truly representative. Um, it's a constant challenge in, in my line of work to make sure that there are institutions and processes in place so democracy can really be have the participation of women, of people of color, of minority populations. Um, and you know, for that's always one of the biggest gaps and challenges. 
um, legislatures around the world, including in my home state of Georgia, um, are considering legislation that will curtail democratic rights. Um, and here at the Carter Center, the methodology, the lens through which we analyze and make assessments about democracy and elections is based in a international human rights framework. Um, and I've always seen those rights as kind of as foundational, um, as kind of the lowest common denominator, as something upon which we would build. Um, and we've seen, um, especially over the last year, legislatures, you know, really um, some of those rights are, are under attack. And, and I, that's, that's been a real concern. The COVID-19, um, in addition to being a health crisis, um, has also been a crisis for democracy and human rights um, that's required those of us working in the field to really pivot, to figure out how to address um, some of the new challenges um, that have been popping up over the last year. Um, the pandemic contributed to some elections were delayed or canceled, health protocols prohibited public protests or otherwise undermined the freedom of assembly and expression. And we've seen some new versions of old threats, um, corruption and abuse of power um, by those who are inclined towards authoritarianism. In some places, and including in the United States, COVID-19 has meant an introduction of like, new and different election procedures and um, to hold elections well during the pandemic. Um, and in some cases, the introduction of those new procedures has then become the foundation of complaints um, against the election and you know, is raised, given some cause to raise questions about the results of those elections. Um, in 2020, I was focused on two elections in particular, um, one in Guyana in South America and another in Liberia um, in West Africa. Um, and in Guyana, um, there was, elections took place on March 2nd, um, kind of as the pandemic was just coming on. Um, so it was really the post-election environment um, that was affected the most. Um, and then there were some real concerns that officials took advantage um, of COVID-19 to limit transparency by not allowing um, observers access to um, observe, to provide transparency around the national recount process that was happening of those elections. Um, in Liberia, there were senatorial elections, um, midterm elections, um, and a referendum on constitutional amendments that happened in December. Um, and we worked closely with a partner organization there. And one of the highlights for me of their work, they had the opportunity, because of the delays, they had the opportunity um, to really to observe a, um, a good chunk of um, the electoral period. Um, and one thing that really stood out for me from their work is um, a survey that they did um, kind of relatively early on in the pandemic um, that found an increase um, in domestic violence during lockdown in the pandemic. And they drew some correlations between lockdown, this increase in domestic violence, and it raised some questions about um, women's political participation in particular, and the extent to which women were able to engage effectively in the pre-election environment as candidates. Um, it's working with political parties and, you know, being able to put themselves forward um, to as poll workers, things like that. Um, I would say um, here at the Carter Center, COVID has impacted election observation and our methodology. We've had to adjust how we operate to be able to collect data. Um, we can't send a, a bunch of um, international observers traveling um, like we used to. So we've had to adjust our methodology and how we collect data that enables us to provide an assessment of an election. Um, but for me, COVID has also, while it's been challenging to do this kind of democracy work during COVID, it's also shown to me how important I think democracy work is, um, and especially election observation, which happens um, to be my field, um, that I think we've seen that the importance of providing transparency around democratic processes during pandemic times is maybe um, more important than ever. And when citizens need access to impartial information about what does and doesn't happen during an electoral cycle. Um, and Myanmar is a, is a good example of that, although there's a very serious um, challenge now happening um, and that nice and democracy, it highlights for me um, the importance of observation and that reports from observers um, from those elections in November, reports from observers pro that provide an alternative narrative to that that's being put forward by the coup leaders. So there's this separate, you know, there's a set of data and a set of information um, and some facts about what didn't, didn't happen during the election um, that are in election observation reports um, that are fueling um, the discussion um, now that's happening um, between citizen protesters um, and the military. Um, 
yeah, I can wrap it. I can wrap it up. Um, I just want to also highlight, though, quickly um, for folks who might have missed on um, this morning sessions. Um, one thing that really stuck out for me were comments um, made by my colleague Jim Bodai of Afrobarometer. Um, and you know, I, I think about, I look at their surveys, um, and I, I find them really useful. And, and he you know, mentioned that even you know, with these challenges, in some cases, democracy has been slow to deliver. Um, but still, across the continent of Africa, the majority of citizens very strongly, um, you know, say that they prefer democracy um, as their form of government. And, and to me, I, you know, that speaks to their citizen interest. There's, a, I think, a populist interest um, in democracy, um, and I, that gives me hope. Yeah, I did want to ask you about that, actually, um, Brett and Lazo, because I was thinking about his comments specifically about the fact that populations really crave democratic governance and representation, and that the problem with de-democratization is really what he said on the supply side. And Condoleezza Rice said something similar, which was, look, it's not in the DNA of Russians to not prefer representation and enfranchisement. They absolutely want that. It has more to do with leadership. So I wonder if I could have each of you, and we do, I should say, have a number of great questions also in the queue, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. But before I turn to that queue, I do wanna hear from both of you on the degree to which uh, democratic erosion is, is happening more strongly on the public side versus on the leadership side or vice versa. I wanna know what you perceive to be driving. And I think from Laszlo's earlier comments, I might, uh, infer that he believes it's a leadership problem, not a public problem, but we do have a, a question in the chat specifically about Hungary and the extent to which Democrats can provide a compelling alternative to Orban's vision. And I think, Brett, for you and the number of cases that you talked about, right, and you just mentioned, you think that public support for democratic governments is very strong. And so really it's a supply side uh, issue. If you could each comment on where the problems are emanating from most strongly, that would be helpful. Laszlo, we'll start with you. It's coming back to the, the first way, or the original way you asked this question is, uh, uh, um, I think that uh, uh, the people uh, uh, from the, perspective of people, democracy is about uh, alternatives, about fighting and presenting alternatives, uh, uh, accepting, fighting, identifying with alternatives uh, and so on. Uh, if you have a system in which uh, 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 both on the center left and center right, the major political forces say that there are no alternatives, uh, that uh, 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 the, uh, uh, either uh, we possess the real science of what to do, or, or this comes from outside, from the World Bank, from Brussels, and so on. Then, uh, 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 the, that is this, this dramatic depoliticization of uh, social and economic change uh, gives rise to very strong demand for uh, alternatives. So uh, when uh, these uh, populists arrive, uh, uh, to East and Central Europe, what is for them the most important thing from a perspective of, of people at large is that they finally talk about alternatives, uh, that there are alternatives. We don't have to sheepishly follow the instructions coming from outside, there are alternatives. They are called from outside as unorthodox uh, uh, policies, uh, uh, but, uh, and some of them are really unorthodox. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, actually your work also is partly about that, uh, in banking system or in uh, finances or whatever, uh, uh, they are uh, thing. But when uh, 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 this whole thing starts with a letter uh, uh, from Orban, to Barroso, the president of the European Commission, saying that uh, 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 your suggestion, these are not suggestions, these are demands, uh, uh, your suggestion of what to do about stabilizing uh, the economy after the 2008 crisis uh, 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 are making Hungary a colony. Uh, we are not colony of European Union. So there are alternatives. So it's, it's uh, uh, taking, but uh, 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 it's very interesting that the depoliticization of major political issue leads to a very extreme polarization uh, uh, in which uh, uh, then uh, those who were the center left and center left are claimed to be the non-Hungarians, non-representing the interests of the nation. Uh, uh, 
So uh, it's a very uh, strange thing that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, striving for meaningful alternatives, participation mm -hmm. that gives rise to support, and it's not to say that the, the supporters of Orban uh, are, uh, uh, I don't know, so strongly for authoritarian rule, not at all. Uh, for sure, there are some among them, but most of them uh, uh, see that uh, now this is uh, uh, someone represents alternatives in politics. And the other side of it, that the, the other side uh, uh, lost trust in politics. So they are uh, basically demobilized and slowly they get mobilized. So now uh, uh, in Hungary, you have a 50-50 in uh, uh, public opinion surveys, support for opposition and the others. So now again, uh, 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 so to say, normal politics is creeping back uh, in the form of uh, appearance of political parties that in alliance against uh, uh, Orban say, we represent an alternative. We don't, they don't say now that there are no alternatives. That was, the, that was, the, that was what initiated the whole uh, 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 backsliding, I think. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you, Laszlo, very interesting. Uh, Brett, do you have thoughts on this as well in the countries that you've studied and worked in? Oops, you're muted. Gonna hold on just one second. I think Brett is still muted. Okay, Brett, while you figure that out, I just have another question here that's from um, Karen Bodie. And her question, I'll direct it to you, Laszlo and Tim, if you wanna weigh in as well, you're welcome to while we figure out what um, Brett's technical issue is. It's the issue of free speech and the importance of free speech in democratic governance. And essentially she, what she's wondering is, um, should there be limits on free speech? Um, are there certain kinds of speech? And of course, Europe is a different context from the United States, which is a different context from other parts of the world in which, in fact, in some political context, speech can be uh, circumscribed in order, in theory, uh, in the service of democratic governance. I'm wondering, um, Laszlo, if you want to weigh in on that, and then we'll turn, turn it back over to Brett. I have uh, participated in many uh, discussions at Central European University on exactly this question. Uh, uh, I more for uh, uh, freedom of uh, speech in the sense of, of allowing for discussion. There are uh, 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 dangerous parts uh, of that, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in Hungary that uh, I haven't seen uh, such, uh, any kind of uh, limitations of that. Uh, uh, whenever it was discussed, uh, I was convinced that uh, allowing for discussing them uh, was more useful than trying to suppress them. Good. Okay, Brett. I think we have. We think we have you back. You back? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I pushed okay. a weird button earlier, um, okay. <laughs> but it's back. Um, yeah. So I guess on the supply demand um, issue. Um, there's a couple of comments also that stuck with me um, from this morning about that. Um, and one of them is also um, is, is Gemma from um, Afrobarometer who made a comment about that there's, you know, there's a gap in leadership um, right now. And I think that's a serious um, issue. Um, but you know, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think those leaders aren't, you know, even though there's a, there's a gap of leadership, it's, it's not that the authoritarians who are having some success, um, it's not that they're completely without support. Um, and I think that the um, session um, this morning on misinformation and disinformation um, is a really, um, you know, a, important piece of the puzzle here that I, I think access to information and access to quality information and access to the truth and really civic education um, is something that is, you know, needs to be stronger. Um, and, and my sense is that, you know, there's always been challenges with civic and voter education. It's you know, always been a weakness. There's never enough of it. Um, but I do think that that's the key to you know, helping make sure that informed citizens can pay a role in their democracy and can make an informed choice um, in an election that you know, that's, that's what it's gonna take for democracy to be able to evolve and really be an effective um, form of government and help us be able to address some of these other global challenges like climate change um, and, you know, and other things. And so you know, at the end of the day for me, that's, I, I feel like it's about 
education and informed population having access to the truth and being able to really genuinely participate in an effective way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tim, yeah, did you want to weigh in as well? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd be uh, happy to. And in fact, I just would, um, uh, as an academic, can put a label on some of this discussion, which I think is uh, fantastic coming from also in terms of uh, mobilization against uh, autocratic tendencies and as Brett suggests a sort of enduring the support for democracy in, uh, in, in a rapidly evolving and sort of new middle class uh, Africa. So there's a really interesting issue what we would call it I think in terms of this question of when is democracy resilient at least one answer to that is so called value resilience and that is that you have a sort of a political culture or a set of values in society where uh, democracy is accepted as a norm. And so this is one of the big debates about this autocratization uh, problem. Uh, how uh, short term is it or how long term is it? I'm um, come out on the more optimistic side right on this issue that we see growing uh, education, growing uh, income, uh, stable middle class societies around the world. And at least uh, what we know from looking at the historical record, this is the nature of value resilience. In other words, citizens uh, mobilized to protect uh, democracy based on these uh, values uh, of, uh, of support for democracy. So I think it's a very interesting way that we've seen how this has occurred both in Hungary and then also throughout some of these contexts that Brett has worked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as it happens, we have a question not about values resilience, but about institutional resilience, which uh -huh. we'll get into that discussion. So as it turns out, um, you know, it was just a few years ago, 2016, I think, that a greater proportion of the world's population than ever before was living under democratic institutions in the world, which is amazing. And at this point, five years later, we're just slightly below that. Right, so I think this does get to what Tim just said and some themes that Brett and Laszlo have been already talking about, but I do wanna ask about institutional resilience because the question here in the Q&A is about, given that we have fallen some distance from our democratic high in some ways in 2016, what are the steps that polities or politicians need to take in order to restore greater institutional resilience or perhaps build stronger institutional resilience in the first place? How do we recover? Uh, and what do we do about the damage that's been done to institutions uh, over the last, in some cases, five years, in other cases, it's been longer than that. Quite a lot of institutional damage has been done. How do we recover from that? Hmm. Uh, I can start uh, uh, in Hungary. That's uh, uh, that's one of the key questions because uh, 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 here uh, uh, nearly too obvious. Uh, 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 what was the problem uh, of the lack of uh, institutional re resilience? Uh, it's a constitutional failure. Uh, there are market failures, state failures, and there are constitutional failures. The constitutional failure was that uh, uh, you can get uh, with 66% uh, uh, of the seats, uh, uh, of the votes in the parliament, uh, uh, change uh, in the constitution. Uh, so th that kind of defenses uh, for uh, rulemaking, uh, uh, and making binding decisions and changing laws uh, and changing institutions uh, were not given a defense that, for example, the US Constitution or many of the constitutions in the world have uh, uh, with a bad uh, uh, elect combination of bad electoral law uh, and the bad constitution uh, can create a situation in which uh, with 49% of, uh, of uh, the votes, popular votes, uh, uh, you can change the name of Hungary, uh, or uh, you can uh, change anything uh, in the constitution and on a daily basis. And that's not uh, a constitution. So that's so. The, uh, so to say, the minimum, the starting point is uh, 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 having uh, uh, a legal system uh, uh, in which uh, the uh, incumbents and the winners of uh, the elections uh, are bound by law. They cannot uh, use law. Uh, they are uh, limited by law. And uh, if that is, this kind of institutions are weakened, uh, then uh, you cannot speak about institutional resilience. It means incumbents can introduce one party system uh, overnight. Uh, so, uh, 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 and that stresses the importance, uh, uh, not just of, of, uh, of robust defense uh, for, 
mutually accepted constitutions. That's an, a, a, the way that, is, that there should be a consensus around the constitution, yes? Or at least this is uh, a multi-party election. So major political process have to be. But once this is in place, uh, the other thing is a very important, strong uh, presence of checks and balances. Uh, this, uh, uh, once uh, uh, these are uh, abolished, uh, institutional residence is meaningless. There's no such things. Uh, 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 in comparison uh, to, uh, it's very interesting how, for example, many of the attempts of uh, uh, Trump uh, to undermine uh, uh, democratic rule were uh, uh, stopped by judiciary, by uh, functioning of checks and balances, even uh, 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 after in this election that was, uh, uh, we were amazed in Hungary watching uh, the drama after uh, uh, the election. That uh, uh, even the uh, and, and that's 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 part of the institutional elements. Sticking to the values uh, uh, of of democracy, that even uh, judges who were appointed by uh, Trump uh, were uh, rejecting. Uh, uh, attempts uh, to undermine uh, the legitimacy of the election. So these two things, I think, uh, constitutional things, co uh, uh, checks and balances, and then this ethos of, of, uh, of uh, the rule of law, I think these are uh, crucial for resilience, institutional resilience. Good. I'll just, um, Brett, before I turn it over to you, and there's another question for you, Brett, about multi-party versus two-party systems, which I'm going to ask you about in a minute, and Tim may want to weigh on that question too, but point out the um, assessment of the state of democracy across the world, of course, depends on what index you're looking at, and I should highlight the fact also David Orr pointed out that he thinks the United States has actually never been, never been a democracy, um, and so when I was saying that a few years ago, by some estimates, the world was more democratic than it had ever been. Uh, of course, that's a contested, that's a contested claim. I should say that at the beginning. Um, but Brett, there's another question here about um, if democracy is about alternatives, do electoral processes that allow and promote multi-party systems over bi-party systems lead to a, dem a more democratic system overall? And given the huge array of democratic systems with which you've worked, I wonder if you have uh, a bird's eye view of whether multi-party systems are more Democratic, more representative, more more functional in a way uh, than bi-party, two-party systems. Sure, it's a really interesting question, and I'm, I'm interested in Dr. Sis' perspective on this actually. Um, but you know, I would say there's it's there's not a one size fits all, I think, answer to this question. And every country is different and every country has a different ethnic composition and a different political history. Um, and you know, it's that it's the demographics and the political history that one has to take into consideration when you're thinking about um, and what an electoral system um, is gonna make sense for, for that population to ensure representation. And again, it's not, um, it, it's not a one size fits all kind of answer. And, and when we're making you know, recommendations about those kinds of things, about how to regulate political parties or um, the relationship between the electoral system and political parties, um, you know, we, we put a lot of time and energy into you know, really analyzing demographics and you know, um, looking at academic research um, from folks like Dr. Sisk and you know, thinking about what's gonna make the most sense in, in those contexts. Um, yeah. Yeah, very good. I'll, I'll jump in on that. Thank you, Brett, to say that uh, in fact, I think the consensus among election specialists would be no, there's no like uh, best electoral system uh, but we do know that the choice of an electoral system speaks exactly to this question of the number of political parties and the persistence of the two party uh, system, particularly in the United States. And I have a very clear view on this. I think the two party system, as was suggested by a number of panelists this morning, uh, is highly limited. It's limited as a, a result of the electoral process. You know, we could see all the way back uh, through, uh, through from from Ralph Nader to many others that the third party candidates really don't stand a chance in the US system. Um, if I could uh, design it anew with all of those demographic uh, kind of factors that uh, Brett rightly uh, 
uh, suggests needs to be assessed. I, I kind of like the idea of uh, mixed member uh, uh, proportional representation for the United States, but the big problem always is these kind of things, which should pro what produce four to six political parties and give give more choice, more voice uh, to the electorate. Uh, but the problem is how to get the, uh, from here to there. We have a system that has a high degree of uh, of uh, historical uh, uh, placement that means it's very, very difficult to reform. We see in the United States the turn to ranked choice voting, but my concern about ranked choice voting is that it doesn't really resolve the problem of majority rule. It just makes it uh, less minority rule um, and gets it to majority rule, but that doesn't affect the party system. The party system, I think, under ranked choice voting would likely continue to be two party in the United States. So to me, that's a, a best an interim fix uh, for the US. Thanks, Thanks very much, Tim. Um, I have a, a question here specifically for Brett. It's from Sarah Tucker. Uh, and this is something that also comes up in the democratization literature. She's wondering if there are drawbacks and weaknesses to the current philosophy on election monitoring. And part of the reason I'm so interested in this question is because Nancy Bermeo a few years ago pointed out that the uh, international efforts to provide more transparency and election monitoring have led to a sort of paradoxical fixation on elections so that even authoritarian regimes will hold elections to try to signal their legitimacy. But it, it means that elections can increasingly, at least in some countries, be a facade for something that's uh, actually quite nefarious in terms of the lack of representation. So her basic question is, are there, are there ways to do election monitoring differently that actually genuinely encourage democratic governance as opposed to providing a mechanism through which authoritarian leaders can claim legitimacy by virtue of a democratic process that isn't actually democratic? Sure. Um, it's a it's a great question, um, and I'll, you know one that we get a lot. And I'll say, you know, I'm biased. It is my profession, um, but you know, I'll say that my you know my my hope is that eventually, um, you know, maybe not in my generation, but that in future generations, that election observation is something that is kind of that is baked into every um, electoral process. That it's something that you know I'd love to see it here in the United States. We we don't have a you know real. Um, nationally recognized nonpartisan observation organization that collects data from every state across the country and can provide a unbiased nonpartisan national perspective on what happens in an election. I, I'd love to see it happen in every country and every election and be a standard um, as a nonpartisan source of information. Um, but you know, I, I would say it, I, again, Myanmar is, you know, has been really standing out to me recently um, and in recent weeks is an example of, of why it is so important um, and why, you know, it's been difficult for people to get access to information during a pandemic about what didn't didn't happen during that election um, and the voice of the observers um, who were there doing this work um, around the elections in November. That's, um, that's been really critical um, in recent weeks to, you know, really battle this um, a, a narrative um, about what didn't, didn't happen during those elections. And I, I think that's been of critical importance. And I, you know, even Sudan, um, the Carter Center, and I worked on this observation mission um, in an election which Bashir won um, in 2009 um, in Sudan. And we, you know, we were there, there were accusations at the time um, that observers shouldn't be or shouldn't play a role, that we shouldn't be there, um, that there were signs early on that the elections were stacked um, in Bashir's favor. Um, but we felt that it was important to be there to, you know, be able to collect information and provide reports and to be able to support citizens and support um, Democrats in Sudan who, you know, were, had an opening of civic space to participate um, in those elections. And we issue, you know, we, we call it like we see it. We issue um, reports um, that we think um, are fair and balanced. Um, and we made some really strong criticisms of those elections and issued a report saying that we felt that the outcome of those elections didn't reflect the will of the people. Um, so, you know, we don't have any as observers, we don't have any role. We're not the election authority. We don't have any, you know, we can't, we don't certify results or um, anything like that. Um, but we can say the extent to which we think those results reflect the will of the people. Um, and we, we try to do that um, with consistency. Good, thank you. Very interesting. Um, I have a similar, perhaps a similar question, Lasso, that's more, I think, in your area of expertise. Because what you've said about the EU in a certain sense uh, 
either itself depoliticizing critical issues or being used to depoliticize critical issues. There is this question um, about what productive role the EU can play vis-a-vis -vis democratic backsliding as we perceive it, as you mentioned in not just Hungary, but Poland, Slovenia. Um, given everything that you've said about the um, rather structured and perhaps even colonial nature of the post-communist transition in Eastern Europe, can the EU play a constructive role? You know, we heard Milada Vakurova this morning um, talking about how it should be more active, more insistent. I've also heard other very well-informed people say, no, if the EU takes a firmer hand in these democratically backsliding countries, you're going to get a backlash. So what is the answer to the conundrum of how external actors intervene productively or do they not have a role? And speaking specifically in this case of the EU. Mm -hmm. Uh, the colonial is not my, uh, this is Orban's language, uh, very important. <laughs> uh, 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 this is a colony that uh, the biggest problem, I would, if, if, in a nutshell, is that it gives too much money for free. It corrupts these uh, regimes. Uh, 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 I don't know whether uh, this is well known, but uh, uh, Greece uh, got uh, uh, in the last 30 years from EU more than the whole Marshall Fund was uh, uh, in the 1940s, more. Yes, uh, Poland gets closer to that. Uh, Hungary uh, got uh, around uh, sixty percent of the Marshall Fund, so it's enormous amounts of money. It's three, four percent uh, of uh, the money. So you would love to have such a colony, yeah, uh, or a colonizer. Yeah, and this, is, this is the problem. Is not that uh, uh, the problem is more what you said before that it can be used. Uh, as a pretext, as, as a scapegoat, uh, uh, first of all, and it can be used because it depoliticizes uh, issues. It, it acts like an enforcer of uh, uh, 80,000 pages of market, now 100,000 pages of market rules, and basically allowing for free movement of goods, uh, uh, products, uh, sorry, uh, services, uh, capital, labor. But not dealing uh, at European level with the developmental consequences. It, it so to say, it says that this is a national business. This is uh, uh, economic policies, uh, uh, financial policies, uh, uh, dealing with the, the developmental the consequences of, of this uh, market is national business primarily. Uh, 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 and uh, that's, uh, that's a problem. The, the people don't see that uh, this kind of problems that uh, the, the populists uh, politicize in Brussels uh, 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 are politicized uh, in, uh, uh, at the level of EU. So in a way, uh, uh, the problem of EU is, is not that it's colonizing, but it gives money without controlling and it, it's, it's, it's really uh, 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 sustains, uh, helps to sustain. Uh, authoritarian rule uh, in Hungary. The problem is that it should have uh, uh, economic policies uh, that would say, okay, we upgrade the, uh, uh, the regions, the small villages, uh, help uh, upgrading uh, uh, industries and so on. So um, it's a long, bigger question. Uh, uh, EU needs a, a, a big reform. Let's put it in, in a nutshell this way. Good. Well, the EU is not the only one that needs major reform. We know that. Sorry? Okay, so the EU is not the only one that needs major reform. We know that. Um, oh, yes. so we are closing in on the hour. And I have a, a question here from Doug Scrivener, which is about, and this should you know, ring home for all of us, the role of universities as institutions in preserving democratic governance. Or, I mean, you might look at it the other way, universities in some countries over history have had a very negative effect on democratic governance. So I wonder here at, at the end, and if you could just keep your answers very short, because Tim's going to wrap up in a second, we could go first to Brett, then to Laszlo, and then Tim, if you want to weigh in on that question as well, before you wrap us up, that would be great. What role do universities play in perhaps the civic education or in the institutional design for countries to help them support democratic governance? Brett, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I'd say universities are critical. I, I think it all 
I feel like all of the challenges of democracy boil down to education um, at the end of the day. And I think that there's so much um, that universities have done and so much more um, that they can do um, in helping with you know, civic education, but as you know, also the kind of academic research um, that y'all are doing, um, helping to put more information to playing a role in strengthening um, institutions in the time period between elections, I think is really important and something that universities can, can play a big role in. So I think there's a huge role for universities. Good. Okay. Lasso, do you have any thoughts on that? Working as you do? I always, since, since I'm uh, in the yeah. university since 92, uh, I have always, of course. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, uh, if democracy is about alternatives, then uh, 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 for the universities, the most important thing is exactly what uh, Brett said, is teaching uh, people to think about alternatives and, and argue about that and participate in, in uh, uh, organizing civilized debates about that. So the, both sides are important. One is uh, 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 the uh, uh, training people to participate in debates about society, about uh, economy, and also uh, training them for civic engagement. Uh, 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 that's, uh, I think, the most important thing in a nutshell. Good. Thank you both very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Tim. Well, thank you, Rachel. And uh, I just a very nice uh, question from uh, Doug Scribner on the question of universities. Uh, in my own experience, too, it's at university settings. and. Uh, in many countries around the world, South Africa, Nepal, Colombia, et cetera, where uh, human rights organizations are often found closely embedded, for example, in uh, law schools or in other uh, instances in the Corbell School within the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies that I'm running. We have an asylum project, for example, where we bring together sort of experience on threats to individuals in their home countries and how that pertains to their asylum claims in the U.S. So this is a, an area, I think, of universities uh, that is important and very much part of the efforts, uh, for example, of the Carnegie Corporation to support universities in Africa uh, because of the sort of co-location of defenders of democracy uh, in uh, university settings. Um, well, we are out of time for what's been a very um, engaging uh, breakout session. I've enjoyed it very much. We've touched on uh, all of my favorite buzzwords on this uh, question of defending uh, democracy. That is the uh, values resistance and uh, uh, resistance indeed and, and resilience. Uh, of uh, citizens uh, uh, advocating for rights. Uh, we've had institutional resilience, of course, you know, and the, uh, Professor Bruch mentioned the sort of constitutional arrangements in, in Hungary and how that may have allowed for autocratization. And so this, this sometimes arcane debates about institutional design um, are extremely important and ones that we'll, we'll have to keep in mind. Then we had the third one, of course, which is international uh, support for resilience. Uh, and here to me, I think one of the most important things about election monitoring and the good work of the Carter Center in this regard is how uh, external monitors uh, connect with and embolden and, and in some ways protect domestic uh, monitors. Uh, and so this is a, a kind of a triad in a way of different types of ways in which uh, uh, democracy uh, has been defended on the front lines. And so uh, in closing, I wanted to, uh, to thank, uh, first of all, Brett, my former student. It's just been a wonderful uh, uh, experience for me to, uh, to see her professional uh, development over time and to think about those upcoming elections like in Sudan coming up uh, that will require no small measure of external assistance. And Professor Bruch, of course, reminding us that uh, you know, really what, what matters uh, for many people are things like livelihoods and how democracy relates to sort of basic uh, issues of how people live their lives is a key part of understanding when it uh, can survive. And then I'd also like to thank my co-host, uh, Professor Epstein, for managing uh, this breakout session today. Uh, and then last, uh, but certainly not least, is to thank everyone uh, who came on. Uh, some fantastic questions, some of which are from current students, so I love those, uh, as well as uh, uh, very important members of our community. So thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, breakout session uh, today, and I uh, wish you all the best for attending the remainder of the Denver Democracy Summit. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Laszlo. Brett, really appreciate your participation. Grateful for your insights. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so Bye. much.
Bye-bye.